Ani Buju, I'm Loretta Ross, Treaty Commissioner at the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba, and I welcome you to the second part of our speaker series, Moving Forward Together, Building on the Spirit and Intent of the Treaties. In our first part series, we had presentations and discussions with elders and academics on the spirit and intent of the treaties, and we hope to set the foundation for the discussion on moving forward. In this series, we will be discussing treaties with individuals from different sectors of the community and gaining their perspective on the treaties and how they understand uh, treaties and the need to move forward together. Today's guest is Ivana Yellowback. She is going to be bringing a youth perspective to understanding and talking about treaties. And I'm going to share a little bit about her bio so you will get a better understanding of who she is and, and what she's doing. So Ivana is a highly accomplished Indigenous woman who brings a wealth of experience and knowledge to her work. She's a proud member of the Mantisipi Cree Nation and a relative of the Matthias Cologne Cree Nation. She has deep roots in both of those communities. Ivana is also a Seneca, Ithinu, Equa, Moshkego, and Inu, which means that she is connected to the land, culture, and traditions of her people in a profound and meaningful way. With over nine years of experience in social services work, Ivana has become a respected leader in her field. She has a proven track record in a program development and implementation and is highly skilled in facilitation and workshop trainings. For years, she has been a mentor and advocate for youth, helping to foster leadership skills and inspire the next generation of Indigenous leaders. Her social advocacy work has been instrumental in supporting and empowering Indigenous communities and her counseling skills have helped countless individuals navigate difficult personal challenges. So welcome, Havana. Happy awesome. to have you here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so, you know, part of the, the series that we're doing is looking at the different perspectives uh, of the community. And we often hear, certainly in the Indigenous community, the youth are our future. Mm -hmm. What are the youth thinking? Um, how are they feeling? And... Do they have the, the understanding and appreciation of the treaties? So, you know, maybe let's let's start there and talk about um, if you remember or, or when do you remember and what do you remember about first learning about the treaties? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, for my memory, it definitely was my parents. My dad often talked a lot about the treaties. He talked a lot about, like, our rights as Indigenous peoples, and it was just everyday conversations while sitting at the table or watching TV. And um, when I started going to ceremony as a young person, um, I want to say maybe 12, 13, that was when I was hearing about in the lodges from elders mm -hmm. and hearing about those stories in regards to the spirit of treaty and, um, you know, those agreements and that partnership, those various partnerships that were made. And also in university, um, when I was you know, in classes with Indigenous scholars and elders, that's where a lot of the conversation started also. And then also organizations, because um, I got to work in different Indigenous organizations and hearing them also from different, like, knowledge keepers, elders, um, and then hearing the stories there and at conferences, things like that. Mm -hmm. So did you find, uh, um, like, growing up with your parents and, and um, the strong connection that you have to the land, and that brings a different treaty perspective, right? Mm -hmm. That brings that oral history to it. And yeah. there's not necessarily that same instruction that you would get in a lecture mm -hmm. where this and this, you know, kind of yeah. going through it because you're living it. Yeah. Right. This yeah. is how um, living treaty uh, uh, from the pers First Nation perspective is being who you are and living yeah. off the land and doing that type yeah, of thing. Yeah, definitely. Did you find when you went to university and you learned um, things about treaty that they differed from maybe what you were yes. taught? Yeah, definitely. Um, I remember growing up and hearing that the treaties were an equal agreement mm -hmm. to share the land, that we didn't cede the land or surrender. Right. So when I was going to university and hearing that we gave up the land through that, um, you know, those dialogues of cede and surrender, a lot of like our elders and community members were like, no, that was, we didn't do that. 
Um, and I remember what was really kind of supporting that when I was in university, that was really kind of groundbreaking for me at that time was when I watched the documentary called Trick or Trady. Mm -hmm. And um, and also just kind of hearing stories from my family about how when they were signing the treaties, how they would actually use alcohol mm -hmm. as a way to... Um, kind of deceit and then they weren't fully explaining the meaning behind student surrender mm -hmm. and um so when I watched that documentary I was like wow like this is something that is really like it had happened it's um you know we've been told this dialogue through so many um university courses through years that we gave up the land but it's like we didn't because at the same time a lot of like my parents um and our elders they would often say, how can you give up something you don't own? Mm -hmm. You can't give up a relative. You know, you can't give up water. You can't give up air. How does that make sense, right? It didn't make sense to, like, my family, our people. So that kind of conversation of seed and surrender was really, like, alien to us, like, from growing up and hearing about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what impact um, did hearing those con I mean you were lucky in mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's the best way to say it but you were fortunate to be able to have that education from your um, parents and your family mm -hmm. about the connection to the land and, yeah. and that type of thing but and many of uh, you know the indigenous youth don't have that yeah um, and when they first learn about treaties and you know you, you hear that you've given up all of this mm -hmm. land how do you think that impacts a young person in terms of who they feel or how they feel about themselves as an individual, but as a First Nation person? Mm -hmm. I feel that, that that would impact their self-esteem and their identity in regards to who they are, um, also their confidence. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, you know, for those that I was, you know, able to talk to other um, students, friends, colleagues um, that were just learning about the treaties at the time, um, again, those kind of like those ideologies that we're often told about who our people are, mm -hmm. you know, through socialization, through school. And it's like even from elementary, you know, we're told that we gave up the land or um, that, you know, Canada was made to, to build way for, you know, civilization, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear those words as a child and you grow up within, you know, those systems, it's hard to not internalize that or believe that. And I find with our young people, um, a lot of them are really shy and have low self-esteem because of those dialogues. Mm -hmm. So I feel that it would like really impact even their spirit, their identity, um, their ideas of who they are, who they think their people are. Mm -hmm. And so when they hear about treaties or they hear about, you know, the empowerment that our people are very powerful, you know, our people are very, um, everything that our ancestors did you know, in regards to treaty was very like carefully considered, you know, they sat in ceremony, um, you know, they prayed, they, they sat by the water, they consulted spirit. And when they hear about those, that process or those teachings, it's almost like, you know, something inside of them. And even myself growing up was like, wow, like things that I've been told about who I think my people are, um, was not true. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can build up your self-esteem, your confidence, be proud of who you are, and then start to share that to, you know, your family members or else your nieces or nephews, the, the next generation coming up. Mm -hmm. How did um, you maybe cope or deal with um, that perception when you went to university? Like how it probably had a bit of a conflict within yes. you or caused yeah. you to say, hmm, what's going on here, right? Yeah, um, I definitely found myself when I was um, in university, especially within the first few years, I was very angry and just had a lot of rage um, because again, we think about like racism mm -hmm. and uh, just going into the academic system that's very, you know, hierarchical and very um, just very different from going to ceremony and lodges. And I found myself having a lot of rage and a lot of fire, um, but also kind of trying to decipher which way to navigate that within myself. Um, 
And, you know, part of just being, you know, within this beautiful indigenous community in Winnipeg, I was really fortunate. Like I grew up in the inner city. I grew Mm -hmm. up in a neighborhood called Central, very predominantly indigenous, especially in the 90s, 2000s, 2010s. And so coming from that upbringing and then going back and forth to both my communities with my grannies, um, you know, there was a lot of like, I guess in a way, a lot of identities mixed in together. Mm -hmm. And then so in university and learning about treaty and then also navigating, building up that self-esteem and that confidence, for me, ceremony really helped a lot. And just really um, connecting with, um, you know, knowledge keepers, older sisters, older aunties um, outside of my family that were also in the community really helped me to um, really like navigate that fire in a way that Mm -hmm. was constructive rather than really angry and upset Mm -hmm. yeah and I think that's normal to feel Mm -hmm. those feelings how to have those feelings because I think all of us when we're faced with something that contradicts our view about who we are Mm -hmm. it's natural to feel that way it's then how you deal with it right and and uh, you saying you know ceremony helped you Mm -hmm. a lot to to be able to deal with that and so I think you know, it's important for young people to to know it. That's okay to yeah. to have those feelings. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what we do with them is also important. And there's always a sense, I think, that we still have to educate. Mm-hmm. You know, it's part of um, our role as well as the you know as the original peoples to continue to teach, yeah. even as a young person. Yeah. You know, and that's a big responsibility to yeah. take on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that that's a big um, part of the work that you do and in the work that you're doing yeah. now, right? Oh, yeah, Is definitely. That? Yeah. Yeah. Just even talking about um, even the differences between um, treaty agreements and the Indian Act. Um, so currently now I work with a lot of families and I'm working with a group of moms right now. And one of the questions that came forward was um, how one of the moms was talking about, you know, being... I guess, the status Indian under mm-hmm. the Indian Act. And she would talk about, she would actually ask, you know, how can I go about getting a treaty card? And so, you know, I asked her about that question. And I said, what do you think a treaty card is? Mm-hmm. And I said, because what you're talking about is a status card. Right. Status and treaty are very different. Yeah. And so, you know, for a lot of our community members, even acknowledging our having, um, you know, that teaching of status and treaty being completely different is yeah. like, they they think it's they think it means the same thing that if you're a status Indian you're a treaty person. Yeah. So I had to pull out the whiteboard. And I'm like, this is what a status Indian is under the Indian Act. These are what the treaties are. Treaties one to eleven and agreements. Mm-hmm. And so we had a good conversation about that during that one morning. And then when the ladies left, they were like, hey, now I know mm-hmm. what the difference is. And I often found that in my own family too. Like um, my family would also use, you know, like oh. Um, you know, so-and-so's treaty, they have their treaty card. And and I'd say to them, no, that's like, we're all treaty people here on Treaty 1. When we're here, we have responsibility to uphold those treaties. Um, But status card is completely different from that. So I think even the education of that within even our community Mm -hmm. is like, it's a lot of work because I feel like a lot of our community members and then those that are non-Indigenous still think that if you have a status card, you're a treaty person, but Mm -hmm. that's not the case. Yeah. Yeah. So treaty education, do you think it's important to have yes. treaty education? And um, in the classrooms, where mm-hmm. would we where would we do that? Yes, I would say um, start when they're small um, with, every, you know, for those like for everyone. Um, I'm just kind of thinking about my nieces and I have three nieces um, that are part of my life. And. Um, you know, my oldest niece, who's 11, her name is Nibby. Ever since she was small, I've, you know, taken her out here to the Forks. We've done offerings. Um, same thing with my other two nieces. Uh, we actually were just here last weekend doing springtime offerings. And I often talk to her and them all about treaties. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, this is what the treaty means, that these are our responsibilities as an Inuak, you know, as the people of the Cree Nation, um, these are, you know, the responsibilities we carry as, as you know, uh, water carriers, etc. And so when we start off when they're young, 
they start to really kind of navigate that as they get older and to really build that competency up within their knowledge and learning. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I really like I, I really like to talk about my niece, Nippy, a lot because um, she's the oldest and um, I often take her out often. And it's like, you know, for her, um, you know, just kind of those even teachings about kinship. And Wakotoin, you know, that that kinship teaching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's very uh, cognizant even about the bugs and the animals, like watching the ground to not step on ants. Mm -hmm. So it's like when when you teach them at a young age of those sacred laws of even treaty, um, you know, it really you can it's really powerful to see them develop that mm -hmm. and just how careful they are with just relations and um, just really acknowledging that. Um, you know, Wakotuin or that kinship is more than just human beings, but it's also the land, mm -hmm. the waters, the sun, the bugs, you know, all those things. And that we have a responsibility to be a good relative to all of those mm -hmm. and even ourselves. So I feel like from a young age throughout, um, so that way we can really build up on that self-esteem and those connections that we have to the natural world. Um, because currently in the education systems that we have, we're very much divided and separated from the natural world. And that's how we're taught. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we talk about treaty education, um, mm -hmm. often we think we have to educate the non-First Nation yeah. person about treaties, which of course has to happen. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about we also ed have to educate yeah. our own people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of that education that has to happen in, yeah. in um, not only in the classrooms, but in our homes and yes. in our communities. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that we often in talking about our First Nation community, when we talk about treaties is um, the treaty right to something. Mm. You know, I have the, the treaties were about my right to um, education, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, and it's true, you know, like the, the treaties did set out certain promises, yeah. but you've touched on um, aspect that I'd like to explore a little bit more because it doesn't often get talked about mm -hmm. and it's that responsibility, Yeah. right? Yeah. Like we, we uh, can't just focus, just like we have to get away from thinking of uh, the status card as a treaty yeah, card. Yeah. We have to start thinking about not just our rights, but our responsibilities. Yes. Yeah. And, um, do you see in the in the younger people um, that confusion or is there an understanding about the responsibility aspect or do we have a lot of work to do in that area as well? I would say um, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just from working with young people today, even families, um, there's a lot of work that just needs to be done in regards to educating or those teachings. Um, and what's also really beautiful about, you know, this work that needs to be done is that people are, are wanting it. Mm -hmm. They're very hungry for it, especially our young people. Um, when you talk about ceremony culture, you talk about those sacred laws. A lot of our young people are very excited to learn about those things because those things aren't taught um, you know, in the classroom or sometimes with a lot of our, our relatives, our community members and even our communities, um, you know, a lot of those teachings are, you know, they're not really right flat out spoken or mm -hmm. shared. And I think that's, a, again, a result of the residential schools and the Indian Act policy implementations. Um, but I feel that, yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done just in regards to, again, sharing those laws of, um, you know, treaty, responsibility, wakotuin, you know, relation and kinship. And just really acknowledging that the treaties are more than just rights. They're, they're more of, um, they also talk about, you know, spirit and intent from the land. And that spirit and intent of, you know, those agreements that our Japanic, our ancestors made and how, you know, us here today, you know, we're a result of those spirit and intent that they made back mm -hmm. then and that we have to uphold that and, um, you know, carry that forward and, you know, whatever way that feels good to us, but in a good way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you view the treaties as, um, you know, if, if we said, I give you a, the written text of the treaty, yeah. what would you say about receiving that? I said, well, here's a treaty, mm. Havana. This, this is it. How would you um, respond to that? I would, I, I've seen the written text, like some of the written texts of some of the treaties. Um, and you know, kind of reading it was a lot different than what 
we heard in ceremony. Yeah. yeah. So I would probably say, oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there's a whole different dialogue right. that was given in ceremony. And that dialogue, um, you know, it was just, you know, hearing some of those teachings, some of those ceremonies that, you know, transpired. Um, just really beautiful, powerful stories that even today, like what's really, um, what's really powerful about them when I think about the treaty stories or some of them is how if we were to sit and talk about them today, it almost kind of seems like it's a story that you're that's a fiction or like, um, you know, a story that is like about, you know, something that is um, not can't be comprehensible today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, our ancestors, like the way that they consulted and called in spirit, like it's was such a powerful process that, you know, it's like there was something very powerful that happened in those lodges and spaces when they called in those spirits and consulted and, um, you know, and, and just even kind of like thinking about how, um, I can't remember who it was that was talking about this, but there was someone that said there's a reason why a lot of like treaty days happen in August, like late summer mm -hmm. was because during that treaty making process, they were being rushed. Like a lot of the, um, uh, Indian agents were coming in and kind of rushing in a way and saying, hey, we need to speed up this process. You mm -hmm. know, they would come the next week and say, do you guys have an answer? No, not yet. We're still consulting. Come back again. Do you have an answer? And then finally, by end of, you know, the summertime, they finally were like, OK, well, you guys keep rushing us. Yeah, we're going to agree. And that's mm -hmm. why so many of our treaty days are in like June, like July and August in those late summer months. And just how when I think about you know, that information that was shared, I'm like, wow, like they really took their time trying to really think and contemplate and meet and gather information together to come up with those treaties. Mm -hmm. So to put that all into a document and say, this is what it is. It's like, no, that was a whole process. I know that they definitely had council meetings. They met with all different societies, et cetera. And it's more than just what's written on that mm -hmm. document. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important part of understanding, you know, the treaties and the treaty relationship mm -hmm. is you, you can't possibly capture everything yeah. into one yes. one document. Yeah. Um, and you have to include all of the other conversation mm -hmm. and get to know your community. Like yeah. you say, you know, why did we enter treaty in, in August? What was yeah. that about? And so that I think involves talking to family members, talking yes. to elders in the community, going to ceremony, because yeah. a lot of the... Um, history with respect to treaties is captured in song yeah. is captured yeah. in, in ceremony and um you know so i think that that tells a lot more of that story and has a, a, a powerful impact on on people that attend and mm -hmm. do those things um do you find that a lot more of the youth are starting to be drawn back to to mm -hmm. ceremony and and those types of teachings yeah yeah definitely um yeah like there is definitely such an interest of our young people coming back to ceremony or wanting to learn about the stories and the songs and the teachings. And I feel that when we come back to ceremony, whatever that looks like for, you know, our relatives, because that may, that may look different for different um, people. Um, but when we start to come back to, you know, those original instructions, I think that that's where we'll start to really... Um, remember mm -hmm. what those treaty agreements talk about and some of those you know remembering those laws that our people had for since time and immemorial mm -hmm. what do you think are some or what do you see as some of the challenges to mm -hmm. getting back to that and to getting the understanding of, mm -hmm. of treaty um definitely the education piece mm -hmm. yeah and having uh, like accessibility for treaty education um, and I feel that, you know, treaty education needs to be taught more than just at the university level, because mm -hmm. for those that do go to university, if they do go into like an Indigenous studies class, they may start to have, you know, hearing about treaties and have that introduction to it. Um, but I feel like it needs to be more than at the university level, it needs to be taught, you know, throughout K to 12. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, yeah, because not as many people have access to university or post-secondary education to even mm -hmm. start to, um, you know, learn about responsibility and treaty. Where do you see, uh, like as a young person, where do you see the responsibility um, for moving things mm -hmm. forward on on treaty? Is it at the the um, or the chief level? Is it at the federal government level? Um, where do you see some of that heavy lifting have to happen? 
I would probably, the way that I would kind of see it is that it's everybody's responsibility, that it's a whole compassing collective responsibility from federal to even, you know, the cities to even just the home, like your home, your home fire. Um, that that treaty conversation, because it encompasses, you know, that federal, um, you know, with Canada now being the, um, you know, kind of partner now in regards to those treaties, that it's from federal to even individual level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just having those conversations, having those chance and that ability to educate, to be educated, to have discussions, practice dialogue, um, and then also to ask questions. Mm -hmm. I feel that that should be throughout. So, you know, we talk about treaty education and starting in kindergarten to, mm -hmm. to grade 12. I mean, that, I think, looks to the future generations, yeah, right? Yeah. What do we do about the the folks that are in there now that are yeah. definitely older than you? Some of them are even older than me. Mm -hmm. But how do we get them to understand treaty better? I would probably say, yeah, just education, maybe programs, um, you know, information sessions like this, mm -hmm. um, you know, videos, gatherings, um, ceremonies, and just inviting everyone mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, making it accessible, whether that's online or, uh, you know, spaces that have accessibility that is open. Um, yeah, just through various venues and avenues, mm -hmm. like especially with technology is definitely one way. Yeah, I was going to ask, mm -hmm. um, how big is uh, technology, social media to mm -hmm. reaching not only like the different generations, but the young people, yeah. right? Because we see yeah. a lot of our young people um, suffering and, and mm -hmm. dealing with a lot of issues. Yeah. Um, is that a, a good way or one of the better ways to maybe reach out to the young people? Yes, I'd probably say social media right now is definitely a huge way, um, especially for those young people that are very... You know, maybe uh, some folks are introverted. Mm -hmm. um, social media can be accessible because it's to someone's phone, to someone's laptop, to someone's TV. And so, yeah, being able to reach out through social media, you know, whether that's through videos, reels, etc. Um, so that those that are at home that maybe don't want to come out to events or conferences can, mm -hmm. you know, pull up on their phone and have the information there or watch a video. Maybe that's short um, or also documentary of some sort. Mm -hmm. How do, um, like, what are some of the challenges um, the young people are, are facing? You know, I, I, they're probably not sitting around saying, well, what do you think about treaties yeah. today? Yeah. You know, like they, they're dealing with a lot of yeah. issues. Um, what are some of the challenges to getting them um, or being able to access their minds and to their attention towards treaties? How can we, how can we do that? I feel like there's a lot, um, there's a lot of barriers, um, you know, just even kind of, um, in social work, like right now we're talking about like poverty, mm -hmm. um, you know, the inflation, food, inflation, food security, housing security, et cetera. Um, and definitely like for a lot of young people, you know, a cell phone is a lifeline because, yeah. you know, that's something that a lot of young people need just to survive, whether that's finding information of where to obtain food security for the day, um, housing, you know, um, where to obtain mental health services. And uh, we're definitely at this time finding that mental health is really, really at like a climbing increase of crisis. Um, so when we talk about treaty, um, I feel like because of being in that survival mode of just trying to survive, mm -hmm. I think that makes it difficult for young people to really have time to kind of push aside to really learn about treaty. Mm -hmm. Um, so I feel that, you know, collectively, if we, whether that's government or funding, et cetera, um, you know, have those needs met. And then at that space, we can create that time for treaty discussions, but also acknowledging that within those treaties, you know, food security is also a part of those partnership agreements. Um, and just really, you know, bringing in that, you know, education in a way that, um, you know, when our all needs are met or in a way that partners with those needs, then we could talk about treaties. Because I feel like it's hard for folks when they're in survival mode to mm -hmm. really make space for education and learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we um, had the the voice here to, to the world and yeah. Ivana, I said, you know, what's what would you like us to focus on the most so that we can reach the young people? Um, mm -hmm. How what would you say? I would say um, 
would it be indigenous young people or all young people? Well, all young people, but yeah. certainly, you know, indigenous uh, mm-hmm. people, um, the young people as well need yeah. need that in the indigenous communities. Yeah, so. yeah. I would say um, security and, you know, building up that security, you know, creating safe spaces to talk about treaty, creating safe spaces to build up self-esteem, self-awareness. Um, so then that way, when we have safe spaces that young people can feel safe within, they can then start to build outward within their community network, um, their connections, and then also their own identity and self-esteem. And, you know, treaty is a huge role in regards to Canadian and Indigenous identity. Mm-hmm. Um, so that way, you know, within a safe space to talk about those agreements, talk about treaty, but also create an overall conversation of how to uphold those treaty agreements together as relatives. And then also to, you know, extend from there to, you know, taking care of each other and community. Mm-hmm. You kind of touched on an interesting thing um, that raises a question in terms Mm of what role do you think non-Indigenous youth Mm -hmm. or younger generation, Mm -hmm. um, what role can they play in strengthening the the treaty relationship or understanding the treaties Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, maybe reaching out and working, networking with Indigenous youth? Yeah, Yeah, um, definitely. Um, learning about the treaties themselves, learning about their roles and parts of being a treaty person here on Treaty 1, whether that's Treaty 2, et cetera, um, and then also being an ally. So mm-hmm. being an ally in, um, you know, acknowledging that, um, you know, the treaties were not honoured and how, uh, you know, there's dialogue that has gone on for generations that the land was ceded and surrendered. Mm-hmm. And to really challenge that notion of that ceding and surrendering in a way of that, instead of that, seed and surrender to then be partnership mm-hmm. and then to really start to, um, you know, work through that process or that ideology alongside Indigenous youth and creating those partnerships, friendships, as, you know, the treaties were intended. Mm-hmm. Uh, so doing some of that critical thinking, mm-hmm. right, about yeah. what, what we've been taught yeah. and what that, as you say, what that narrative has, has yeah. been for so many years. Yes, yeah. Um, so, you know, just kind of to, to wrap things up, we always use the phrase, we are all treaty mm-hmm. people. What does that mean for you? That means for me that we all have a responsibility to the treaties and not just a responsibility to each other as human beings and human relatives, but responsibility to, again, the water, the land, those animals, those plants, those medicines, etc. And when we go about and move about in the world is how are we going to be responsible to all of our relatives, to each other, um, you know, keeping clean, you know, water, mm-hmm. um, keeping the animals safe. Um, etc. Um, you know, really extending that from just a human being connection, kinship, but to the land itself. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to thank you very much thank for coming you. and spending some time with me and, and your openness and sharing your your thoughts and your experiences. And I, I want to wish you well thank in you. all of the work that you're doing. I think you're doing such a wonderful, marvelous um, work and uh, hope that, uh, you know, the Treaty Commission and, and yourself and even myself as Treaty Commissioner can work together. For you sure. know, whatever that we can do, um, we'd certainly like to be able to offer that awesome. to you and, and um, wish you all, all the best. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Miigwech. Mm-hmm.